Philadelphia Experiment. Oh boy, everybody heard about the Philadelphia Experiment, right? Saw the movie? Come on. You got me. The, you're the only one? Come on. Every, Philadelphia Experiment? Come on. Everybody. Roger? Everybody. All right, right on. What are they trying to do? They were trying to make a ship invisible. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt was a good friend of Tesla's. Tesla met FDR when he was the Navy Secretary, and he, and he was really impressed with Tesla. He asked him one of these days, you know, try to help out and uh, do something for the country. Tesla said, sure. Uh, he was director of the project. He was chief scientist until 1942, and until he resigned. And the reasons of why he resigned are pretty controversial, but mostly it was because of issues involving people on the boat during the test. What did they do? How did they, what, what did they do to the boat? What they did was they set up three counterflux north poles around the boat. Three Tesla coils. They made these toroidal magnets, or toroidal coils, and they actually had dual toroidal coils. You want to say something, come on, I know you do. No? Okay. Now what happens when you put two opposing toroidal coils together and you fire up it. There's a field that's created inside. Now, this is a graphical representation of that field, and it looks an awful lot like a yin and yang symbol, huh? Isn't that amazing how these ancient people and their religious symbols keep coming back into the scientific stuff? Wow, yin and yang. <laughs> what does this actually represent? This is a three-dimensional picture of a yin and yang. What is that? Okay, the tennis balls and baseballs, the stitching, that is a three-dimensional toroidal field. Okay, that, the stitching of the baseball. So that is the shape of the field that was happening inside. They had one here, one here, and one here. They put the boat in the middle of this. Uh, this is an Aztec thing, and this is kind of interesting because it's very similar to this, which is also a representation of this toroidal field. Maybe they're trying to tell us something. Kind of like the yin and yang was trying to tell us something. Anyway, they built this thing around the boat. They turned it on, fired it up. Put the boat in the middle of a big Tesla coil, essentially. What happened was a big vortex was created. All the matters whoop, into uh, a big hole. It created a wormhole. Ship disappeared. Wow. Success. So, okay, let's turn it off. We're going to do it again. Right now we're going to put 200 crew on board. <laughs> Phase two. Okay, 200 men were put on board this ship. Tesla said, I don't know about this. I think we need more time. Maybe he said, no, we don't have more time. we got a war coming. We've got to fight this war. <coughs> this was in 1942 when they finally did that thing. So Tesla actually tried to sabotage the equipment. He detuned it so it wouldn't work, but it failed. Uh, he had made quite a few announcements about having contact with aliens. So this actually started in Colorado Springs when, this, when he was starting to get signals back. His receivers were picking up signals. And that was when he first thought he was having contact with the aliens. But basically, it got to the point to where he was actually having verbal conversations with them. And they said, uh, you got to not let them do this test with the people on board because there's going to be big problems. So he agreed and he, he pulled out and did everything he could, but he couldn't stop it. He turned the project over to a man named Dr. John von Neumann. Von Neumann, hmm, sounds kind of German, huh? <laughs> Enough said. Effects of time travel on the crew. Some people were partially embedded in the steel. Others were fading in and out. Some disappeared entirely. Many were insane. Why? Humans are normally locked into a point. At the point of conception, you're locked into a time reference. When you're trying to have a time machine, you create a zero time reference, and you have to put these two together, or it just doesn't work. Time locks are very fragile. When they turn this thing on and all those people on board, they, they fried everybody's time lock. So essentially, their reality was all over the place. They were going in and out of all kinds of different dimensions, what have you. So that's basically what happened. Tesla realized that you needed some knowledge of metaphysics to be able to do this stuff. He also realized that by manipulating time using this technology, you could essentially reverse aging and ooh, I don't live forever, keep yourself at one age forever. And a lot, <laughs> we're going to get into this in Montauk because these guys learned that trick. And, it, and when they would go home from work, they would essentially go home and they would they would they never went home because these guys would use time tricks <coughs> where they went back in time oh, 15 seconds and it was like they never left the office. So they would leave and then they go back in time and then still be there. They work constantly and never and so they go home and sleep, but they weren't actually sleeping because they go back in time and do it again. So they had unending work hours. 
So, so is that why some people say Tesla is still alive today? Yes, today? probably yeah. so. <coughs> now, this is just basically a flow chart that essentially shows the potential progression of where this science could go and be going good directions or bad directions. And this is really what pretty much happened. Uh, a lot of nasty stuff happened, but after the Philadelphia <laughs> experiment, everything was moved to Brookhaven National Laboratories with Von Neumann. Now, everybody know, ever heard of Brookhaven National Labs? There you come. Brookhaven National Labs is a monstrously huge particle accelerator which essentially takes up the entire span of Long Island. So <coughs> half of the, the, the geography of Long Island is dedicated to Brookhaven National Labs. And necessarily, not necess uh, needless to say, Brookhaven National Labs is very close to Montauk Point, which we'll be talking about very soon. And so you can imagine all kinds of uh, stuff that they could do given the technology available at Brookhaven Labs. Uh, real quick, this is going to go on into particle fields, force fields, EMT, flat space, mind engineering, mind recognition, super weapons, all kinds of stuff. So we're, we're not going to stay there too long. Okay, Montauk, electronics and mind control. Von Neumann and crew couldn't do their stuff at uh, Brookhaven because that was a little too public. So they made a deal with the military, I'm not sure which agency it was, but they, they moved into Camp Hero. Now Camp Hero was a forward listening base on the, on the farthest tip of Long Island, and it had all sorts of underground structures, and they took it over, and they said, here, you can have it. They actually retrofitted this big monstrous antenna for their experiments with their little beam weapons and stuff. ITT was the main contractor, and at the time, it 2 was owned by Krupp. We all, everybody know Krupp? No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Krupp, we made all, let's put it this way, Krupp is a major steel manufacturer, German manufacturer of steel. They made all the armor plating during World War II, and it should be noted that they sold that armor plating to the Allies as well as the Germans. They also made steel wheels for the trains, which were purchased by Americans, English, Russians, and Germans. So, as far as the war was concerned, industry banking was not affected. Everybody got everything from everybody. So there was a lot of incestuous stuff going on. So anyway, more clues about the Nazi thing. Now, one of the things that's alleged here, and you guys got to do your own research if you want to prove this or not, but all the personnel brought in to work at Montauk were essentially German uh, ex-Nazis, what have you, brought in under Operation Paperclip. Now, we talked about Operation Paperclip at the UFO thing, and that's why I brought uh, some of that here. But, uh, and I'm going to talk about that real quick, but let's see. They found out that a person has a signature, and this is a wavelength that's unique to that individual, and if they can find that signal, they can create a computer program that allows them to track you, and they can modify that signal. They can send, once they track you, they can send out a second order wavelength that would have a different frequency, which would alter your mind and introduce a new signal, which would cause interference with your signals in your brain. Then you can be commanded to do anything they want. Some people are naturally resistant, like all of us here, who are spiritual and have these glows and holy armor, as I like to call it. As, as we build up our, our energies and our own scale, our fields, we cannot be penetrated by this stuff. So this is, this is a very important stuff, because as we learn to enhance our glows and our energy flow and all this stuff, we're, we're actually giving ourselves force shields that protect us. And so, so we have a lot of power, but it's important that we keep our vibrations high so that we are not sucked into this negativity that puts us at risk of being controlled by these devices here. So about 5% of us are protected. The rest of us, they can control. But for the 5%, they have riot squads and concentration camps. So we'll all be together eventually. This is all part of that Phoenix project. Yep. Operation Paperclip. 